Good morning. Good morning. I'm Fran Davin, your worship associate for today. We welcome you this morning and hope that here, if you seek peace, you may find peace. If you seek to be uplifted, we hope you find that in our community. And if you seek an hour just to get away from the world, we hope that you find respite in our warm and welcoming surroundings. Welcome one and all. So good to see you. This morning, we are lucky enough to have here in our pulpit, instead of on Zoom, the Reverend Kathy Schmidt as our guest minister. <laughs> Kathy is an ordained Unitarian Universalist minister she describes herself as an eco-humanist, strongly influenced by Buddhist practices and teaching. She has served congregations in Massachusetts, Texas, Miami, and Orlando as both a settled parish minister and an intern. She has a passion for interfaith work and is a longtime environmentalist and advocate for social justice. She's semi-retired when she is not off visiting grandchildren. She resides in Orlando with her husband, Charlie Behrens. And now, if we can center ourselves, we will have our opening words as the chalice is lit. These words are from Ben Sewell. From a distance, a group of people is silhouetted by a vibrant sunset. Out of the darkness, light. Out of the light, warmth. Out of the warmth, joy. Out of the joy, togetherness. May this flame hold us for the time that we are here together. The first stone represents the joys that you have experienced this week. The second stone for any sorrows that you have experienced this week. And the third stone is for us to set our intentions for the coming. And now we will have our opening.
I have a special affection for that hymn. Back when I was in seminary, I had the opportunity to have, go to a workshop with the composer, um, Carolyn McDay. And um, she told us about that hymn, and she said she had, after she wrote it, she thought it, you know, it's kind of lightweight. Yeah, yeah, bring you hope. And then she happened to be doing a workshop in a prison with women who found hope truly hard to find. And she had them sing that song. And she said the depth of emotion with which they sang that song truly transformed it for her. And hearing that story changed it for me. And I hope that you'll think of that when we sing that in the future, that it is a song that is truly gets at the deep need, human need, for hope, and don't we all need that? The story for you this morning. Once upon a time, there was a farmer who was out in his field by the side of the road. A traveler passed by and was headed toward the village. The, farm, the traveler spoke to the farmer and said, I'm thinking of moving to this area. Could you tell me something about like what kind of people live in this village? The farmer said, well, first tell me what kind of people live in the village you come from. Oh, they're terrible, said the traveler. <laughs> they lie and they cheat and they steal from one another. That's why I want to get out of there. Ah, the farmer explained. That is exactly how people are here. You'd better not move here. You won't be happy here. You'll need to continue your journey. Several days later, the tra another traveler passed by and also stopped to speak to the farmer. Again, the traveler asked, I, I would like to see and learn more about other parts of the country and maybe to be able to live there. Could you tell me what kind of people live here? The farmer asked this traveler too about the people back home. Oh, they're good people, said the traveler, kind and courteous, and usually they help each other. It's the same here, replied the farmer. Go up to the village and visit. I'm sure you will be very happy here. Now, on first reading, I thought that the farmer had intentionally misdirected the first traveler to keep that kind of crankiness out of his village. But then I realized he spoke the truth to both of the travelers. He told them that the people in his village share the characteristics that they had listed with the people from the places they had gone. Like people everywhere, some people in the farmer's village probably lie and cheat and steal. Like people, like most people everywhere, some people in the farm, in fact, most of the people in the farmer's village probably, I'm gonna need to do this differently. <laughs> um, most of the people in the farmer's village are probably good and kind and courteous and usually help each other. The farmer's prediction of what each traveler would find was based on what they had revealed about themselves, on what each had found in the past. So I wonder, I wonder, what advice would the farmer have for you? Would he, what would he predict about your happiness in this village? So often, the condition of our own heart determines how we experience the world. Now, when I was with you last month for worship on Zoom, I invited you to let me know some of the things that bring you joy. Each offering I said was like a link of joy, a link of joy in this congregation's chain of joy, making you stronger, holding you together through life's ups and downs. Today, for our time of meditation, I'd like to reflect back the joy that you shared 
And knowing that this is a difficult time of year for some people, I invite you to be held by this web of love weaved by those around you. So if you'd like, take a moment to bring yourself fully to this time and this place. Be present to this moment. And if you will, relax your mind and your body and breathe. And now, take in joy. What brings us joy? First and foremost, connections. And for many, that is connection with family. Spouses and partners, hubbies and wives, having them beside us, walking together, just hanging out. And not all of us are the same. Some of us find joy in being single. So many ways to find joy, like our children, and our adult children, when we can have conversations with them and their loved ones, and seeing our children do well, and watching them make a difference in the world. What brings us joy? Grandchildren. Did I mention grandchildren? And children in general, and babies, and their laughter, and caring for them and sharing with them. And you know what else brings us joy? Friends. 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 Being with friends, and now that we can, having friends over again. Long phone conversation with good friends, and exchanges that are personal and intimate. And the memory of an old friend, even after this life is said and done. Connections. And some special connections, too, like sharing connections with our students. Our relationships matter. But so do our relationships with animals. What brings us joy? Our cats and our kittens. Cats cuddling on our lap and dogs. Our dogs past and present and puppy breath. And some specifics. Beagles bring joy. <laughs> and birds and bird watching. Joy comes to us from our relationship with people and, our, and other animals and also with the natural world. We find joy in sunsets and lakes and flowers, our gardens and even our compost piles. And speaking of things that grow, we find another thing that brings us joy, food. Our favorite food, cooking, a great meal, food that is made with care, delicious food, healthy food, and some rather specific foods, gumbo and cheesecake and sweets. And music is joy. Listening to music, teaching music, dancing to music, sometimes even when there is no music, our favorite music, and we like to sing and sing and sing. And we find joys in other forms of self-care, maintaining our healthy weight, being retired and healthy, sleeping when we feel like it and when we need it, and back scratches and other forms of physical touch and meditation and for some communion with the divine. And activity and adventure bring us joy, traveling and kayaking, Body surfing, floating on a lake and in the pool, autumn vistas. And joy is found in human creations, those we make and those we admire. Crafting, stitching by hand, even after the machine has made it available for everyone. Maintaining and improving our homes and architecture in general. Walking in urban environments and solar power and electric vehicles and literature and books and reading and our favorite films. We find joy in noticing our blessings, like being fully employed through the pandemic. And we find joy in love, being loved, giving love, being wanted, and in peace. And in meeting life on its own terms, complex or simple, with grace and gratitude. 
and discovering that as we continue this journey of life, no matter our age, there is still more to learn and to know about the world and about ourselves. And finally, this community brings us joy, its activities and our participation. UUCT is a source of joy. So let us take a moment in silent reflections on all these sources of joys that you carry, as well as those not yet named, that our hearts may be full with the gifts of life. Please join me in just a moment of reflection. Once there was a man who bought a new sports car, a Ferrari. When he got it home, he thought, this car can go really fast. It could be dangerous, and I've spent a lot of money on it. I want it and me to be safe, so I think I should have it blessed. So he goes to the Catholic Church and asks the priest to bless his Ferrari. <laughs> and the priest says, of course, but what's a Ferrari? <laughs> the man felt he couldn't have someone bless his Ferrari who didn't even know what it was. So he goes to the local Protestant church and asks the pastor to bless his Ferrari. Of course, but what's a Ferrari? This time, the man getting desperate explains. But the pastor says, I'm sorry, I am not going to do a blessing for a sports car. Getting frustrated, the man went to the Unitarian Universalist <laughs> congregation and asked the minister there. The minister said, you, he said, you have a Ferrari? Can I see it? And the man shows the minister his car, and the minister and the man have a long talk about how well it handles and other such things. And finally, the man asks again whether the minister will bless his Ferrari. And the minister replies, of course, but what is a blessing? <laughs> This joke comes from a time when Unitarian Universalists, some Unitarian Universalists, were very reactive to traditional religious language. Some of us still are. We don't all like or use the same language, and that's okay, we don't have to. However, sometimes it's fun to explore traditional words and consider how they might have meaning for us. For example, the word blessing, which I'd like to explore today, in part because I believe that understanding blessings can bring more joy into our lives. My real attachment to the word blessing came back about 20 years ago after the events of September 11, 2001. There were a lot of bumper stickers back then, you may remember, that said, God bless America. I kept wondering what that would mean I had no problem with America experiencing good things. It just seemed a little stingy. I wondered exactly what people were trying to communicate. And then I saw a bumper sticker that spelled out my concern. It said, to hell with our enemies, God bless America. 
That, I thought, is what I was afraid of. I had a friend, a UU minister friend, who had another bumper sticker with a different message, and it won my heart. It said, God bless the whole world, no exceptions. <laughs> I wanted to put that on my car, but I didn't because unlike my friend, I'm not a theist. But I wasn't willing to give up the idea of blessings. I believe that the world is full of blessings, that they are all around us and available to us if we will only open our eyes and our ears and our hearts. And often, it is the condition of our own hearts that determines how we experience the world. Now, I do not for a moment want to suggest that we should ignore life's challenges. Life has many challenges and they are real. And yet, the reality of life's challenges does not negate life's blessings. It is through the very act of noticing the blessings that we can be strengthened and given courage for the journey. In our earlier story about the farmer and the traveler, the farmer predicted that each traveler would find exactly what they were used to finding. So what are you used to finding? Life is full of things that we label good and things that we label bad. And it's up to us to choose which version we will use, which set of images, which set of those offerings we will choose to create our vision of the world. Will our understanding of the world be based on a foundation of challenges or on a foundation of blessings? One of the images that I am drawn to in the consideration of blessings is the Hindu god Ganesh. I'd like to introduce you to Ganesh. This is Ganesh, little statue. Um, Ganesh is the very popular elephant-headed god of Hinduism. He is a god of good fortune and a remover of obstacles. He's found watching over the doorways of homes and public places, and even temples to other gods start with worshipers stopping to pay their respects first to Ganesh. My close encounter with Ganesh was at a temple in Ranthampore National Park in North India. Within the park and high on a protected hill is a fort that was built a thousand years ago. We were at the park to look for tigers, but we took a side trip and walked a long series of steps up until the fort. And there, at the top amid ruins, there was an active temple to Lord Ganesh. Nearby, just outside the temple, there was a small market that sold the things that we might need to make offerings at the temple. In particular, it sold fabulous garlands of huge, bright orange marigolds. These, by the way, if they weren't used for worship, were appreciated as snacks <laughs> by the resident apes who loitered outside the temple. My husband, Charlie, ended up giving his garland away because one, one ape was very interested in it. <laughs> Along the path to the temple, we had noticed many tiny stone structures. And we even saw some family groups putting them together. And they were built by people who had visited the temple specifically to pray for a house. This was the custom at this temple, to request that Ganesh remove the obstacle of home, to home ownership, to ask Ganesh to grant the good fortune of a house. The little houses were usually made of four flat stones two sides and a back and a roof. But there were some rather elaborate multi-floor affairs. I was charmed by Ganesh, and before I left India, I bought this little statue. And he has since guarded the doorway of our home. After I got home, I read some about Ganesh. Although like all Hindu gods, he's worshiped differently from region to region, I did not find any evidence that he is generally considered a provider of housing. So perhaps that was just the tendency unique to that particular site that we visited. 
But because of that experience, it's not surprising that I associate Ganesh with good fortune regarding housing. So this took a really interesting twist as we prepared to sell our home a few years later. In the days up to the house going on the market, we received a lot of advice. Right? Everybody's got an opinion. Much of it I'd heard before, things about how to make the house more saleable to increase its sale curb appeal. But there was one piece of news that was new to me. We were told to bury a statue of St. Joseph upside down in our yard. <laughs> Has anyone here ever actually heard of that? Oh yeah, oh yeah, okay, about half I'd say. We heard this from a surprising number of people. I've since done a little reading and learned that this has been quite the rage at times. I can't quite find the origins. It's a little unclear. They're clouded in folklore. But I can tell you that there were a number of places online where you can buy a St. Joseph's real estate kit just for this purpose. <laughs> in our case, sometimes the St. Joseph advice was given so earnestly that I felt compelled to respond to either say I would do it, which I wouldn't, or to explain why not. So I took to telling people, referencing the little statue in our hallway, that's okay, we have Ganesh on the job. <laughs> and this gave me an opportunity, right, to introduce Ganesh, the little charming elephant-headed god, to my neighbors. When our house actually went on the market, we were prepared for it to take about six months to a year to sell. However, it went on the market at an open house at noon one day, and we had the offer that we eventually accepted at 5.10 that afternoon. Ganesh gained some status in the neighborhood that day. <laughs> Whenever I think of that story, I feel blessed that the house sold as quickly and easily as it did as we were just going into the market crash of 2007 at the time. Do I think that Ganesh made our house sell? Eh, hard to say. I do know that he makes me happy and reminds me to be grateful when I see him at the door of our current home. And so I associate him with blessings. I also associate him with blessings because of something I noticed shortly after we, we, we returned from that trip to India. A month after returning, I still wore on my wrist a red thread that I had gotten at that Ganesh temple. And I wrote the following in my journal. I titled it, The Red String. The fade, faded and frayed red string has been around my wrist for over a month. It is the outward sign of the blessing received after making offerings at the Ganesh temple that we visited in the fort on the hill at Rantham Four National Park. Ganesh is the elephant-headed god, the son of Shiva and Parvati. He is the remover of obstacles. This popular Hindu god is the first to be acknowledged when worshipers enter a temple, and he appears above the doorways of many homes and buildings and restaurants. Notice the next time you go for Indian food. It was the only temple where we made offerings. With the help of our guide, we each obtained a flower garland, which we presented to the priest at the altar. Our foreheads were marked with a red dot. Into our upturned palms were placed small mounds of sweets and seeds. Some looked for an appropriate place other than their mouths to deposit the gift. Tempting digestive distress, I popped mine in my mouth, as the locals seemed to do. Then, by the exit of the temple, there was another priest. Watching those before, we gave a small cash offering and received another mark on our forehead. And a string, not much more than a thread, wrapped multiple times around our wrist, a sign, a remembrance of our visit. How long should we keep it on, we asked. Until it falls off, we were told. Now we are back in the States. The string remains. No one, no one except Indians, asks us about the string. I think the others do not see it. It has no meaning for them. 
But the Indians we know, it has meaning. They ask, where did you get this? Where is it from? For them, it has meaning. And we tell them, and they say little, but seem pleased. And I am left wondering, what signs of blessing do I miss? How much do I simply not see because it has no meaning for me? What is right there before my eyes and has no meaning to the people around me, but about which, which, and has meaning to the people around me, but about which I don't even think to ask because I don't even know it's there. That's the end of the journal entry. Learning to look for blessings and to notice blessings, to accept blessings and to be thankful for blessings is an important practice. When I use the word blessings, I'm talking about those good things that happen that are not necessarily the result of anything we have done. I suspect that people in this room and online have different ideas about where blessings come from. What do you think? Are they gifts from a god or goddess? Do we create them? Do we earn them? Are they the result of our own hard work or our wishes and prayers, pure luck, our privilege? Regardless of their source, I'm inclined to think that there are far more blessings around us than we tend to notice. We are quick to ask why bad things happen to good people. We are less quick to ask why good things happen to complicated and often confused people just trying to get through the day. <laughs> of course, there's no one right answer. But often, I believe that good things happen to people who look for them, notice them, accept them, and are thankful for them. It's an important practice. A corollary to my belief that unnoticed blessings surround us is my belief that blessings must be universal. That is, the good in the world is best when it is shared by all. I do not tend to see blessings as personal. I don't think that there is a source of blessings that would, for example, intentionally keep one person, person from boarding a plane that will crash while callously ignoring the plight of the other 200 passengers. I don't believe that God is on anyone's side in sporting events or wars. <laughs> I do not believe that my God is stronger than your God or that Ganesh is more likely to sell a house than St. Joseph. I do believe that blessings abound universally. I do believe that all our gods and goddesses, our positive thoughts and our mindfulness, our awareness and our prayers, all of these, Help us to tap into the great pool of blessings that surround us always. It is a fine thing to seek blessings for ourselves and those we love. But ultimately, ultimately the blessings that flow into our lives will do so more abundantly when our hearts are open and when our wish translated to the theology of your choice might be, God bless the whole world, no exceptions. May it be so. Our closing hymn is We're Going to Sit at the Welcome Table.
offer these closing words as we extinguish our chalice. There is an expression that finds its way quite often into my words of parting. Go and be a blessing to the world. Think about what that means. Go forth from this gathering ready to be that thing that happens in someone's life, that good thing that happens in our world, something that no one earned, no one deserved, no one was worthy of, that's something that happened anyway. Don't just preserve the good in the world, help to create more. Today, tomorrow, and every day, go and be a blessing to the world.